What hour your clock strikes here, it's always Halloween. And I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Last week, we discovered the ways in which Halloween traveled to colonial America. We also touched on how the scarier aspects of the holiday got tamped down by Victorian Americans who instead favored parties centered on romance and matchmaking. So today, I want to dive a little bit deeper into these Victorian celebrations so that we can learn where some of our hard partying ways came from. But what time period even is the Victorian era? If you are an American Girl doll fanatic like me, you might be thinking about Samantha Parkington, whose story was set in 1904 and first got me interested in the time period as a kid. The Victorian era was actually a rather large stretch of time, spanning from about 1820 to 1914, which corresponds roughly to the period of Queen Victoria's reign in England. But for today, we'll be focusing mainly on the end of the 19th century. That's the late 1800s. Halloween was extremely gendered during this time period. It's when the phrase, boys will be boys, was actually new and not a cliche. Oh God, honey, no. And it was always applied to what I can only characterize as extremely irritating Halloween pranks. Take this blurb, from 1897, for example. The spooks and spirits evidently got their work in Muskegee Halloween night. They left evidence of their visits in various manners. Gates were missing, sidewalks were misplaced, doors were fastened by dry good boxes, and rubbish was heaped up in front of doors. Signs, barber poles, and placards were disarranged, and things turned topsy-turvy everywhere. It comes but once a year. (sighs) Boys will be boys. And that comes from the Muskegee Phoenix of Muskegee, Oklahoma, slash Indian Territory, November 3rd, 1987. Here's another article citing the wagon prank I mentioned on last week's episode. Several of our boys thought they would celebrate Halloween by making everyone feel as if burglars were around. At one place, they had gone so far as to put a wagon and a sleigh on top of a building. And that is from the Summit County Beacon of Akron, Ohio, published on November 7th, 1887. But while boys were absolutely decimating people's days with outrageous pranks, girls were hosting Halloween parties with the express goal of finding out which of these scamps they might marry. These parties were held in young ladies' homes, where they invited their female friends over for fortune-telling and matchmaking. According to this article from 1887, it seems local boys even tried to crash once they hid every wagon in town. Mrs. Irene and Winnie Spangler gave a delightful Halloween party Monday evening at their residence on Ferncliff Avenue. It was designed to be exclusively a dove party, but it is whispered that some of the rude rascals known as boys broke into the ceremonies and insisted upon remaining. The evening was spent dancing, card playing, and enjoying all the sweetly mysterious sports which characterize the vigil of All Saints Day. And then that one's from the Springfield Daily Republic of Springfield, Ohio, on November 5th, 1887. Last week, we learned about divining one's future spouse through apple peels, egg yolks, and mirrors. Some fortune-telling rituals at dove parties, like the one mentioned in Springfield, would go beyond looking for a man's initials in compost and get pretty competitive. 
Occasionally, parties would break out of the house to go on chestnut hunts, and the first woman who would find a burr would be celebrated as the first one to get married. I'm engaged! I'm getting married! (laughs) At this time, apple bobbing, a long-beloved Halloween game, had a similar aim as the chestnut hunt. The first successful apple bobber would be the first one down the aisle. Apple bobbing actually goes back further than the Victorian era, however. While historians debate this, it is thought to have been a game that originated during ancient Samhain festivals, or possibly was brought to the Celts from the Romans who celebrated a similar autumnal gathering called the Pomona Festival. Pomona was the Roman goddess of fruit and trees and was often symbolized by an apple. Here's another article highlighting the romantic superstitions Victorians held around Halloween. Walking down cellar stairs or around the house backwards and holding a glass at midnight will ensure a view in the glass of one's future partner in marriage. Before retiring, Stir a little salt in the yolk of an egg and eat it. Or say the Lord's Prayer backward, and prophetic visions will come in your dreams. And that little bit of crazy comes from the Emporia Weekly News of Emporia, Kansas, on November 6, 1874. The recasting of Halloween as a romantic holiday was largely due to anti-immigrant sentiment in regards to the Irish, whose snobby upper-crust Victorians found as distasteful as the destructive pranks that were becoming commonplace. One of the earliest mentions of Halloween in a national publication was in Godey's Lady Book in October 1872. For those not familiar with Godey's, According to the Cleveland Museum of Art, it was one of the most popular and long-lived women's magazines, running from 1830 to 1898. Each issue included fiction, nonfiction, poetry, advice on interior decorating, fashion and domestic arts, instructions for needlework and handicrafts, and music. The magazine evolved into an important literary magazine, and published articles and book reviews by many notable 19th century writers, including Edgar Allan Poe. Quoth the Raven, oh my! Oh my! In this particular article from October 1872, however, I cannot agree that anything about this writer's sentiment is notable. In fact, I find their casual, classist xenophobia distasteful, to say the least. I'm including it now to illustrate how this point of view was used to separate Halloween from the Irish and chalk its rich history up to silly ethnic customs. The writer concludes the article by explaining that the celebrations are only held by the old-style English, Irish, Scotch, and Welsh residents. He goes on to say, Amongst the American people, but little other sport is indulged in than the drinking by the country folk of hard cider and the masticating of indigestible crullers or donuts. The gamelins make use of the festival to batter down panels, dislocate bell wires, unhinge gates, destroy cabbage patches, and raise a row generally. Harumph. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Give the governor harumph. Harumph. You watch your ass. Wow, that's so rude. Gamelins, by the way, was an old-fashioned term that meant street urchin. If only they'd look closer. Okay, Dickens. According to Halloween historian Leslie Bannatyne, this was not just a viewpoint held by one bigoted Victorian. Strong anti-Catholic editorials were published in Harper's Weekly as late as 1875. 
the upper classes preferred to remember that their ancestors in Northern England or Scotland, rather than the thousands of Irish Catholic immigrants, brought Halloween to America, and that All Saints Day was an Episcopalian religious day rather than a Catholic one. But everyone out there in its always Halloween land knows that the earliest iteration of All Saints Day was founded by Pope Bonifacia on May 13th, 609 CE. Suck on that, you 19th century Victorian jerks. Well, I never. So after all of this effort to smear the good name of Halloween, how did we get it back from the wretched claws of the lovelorn Victorian elite? Well, by the turn of the century, an obsession with outdoing one another at these matchmaking Halloween parties led women to searching out every possible theme they could find, which included bringing back some of that classic symbolism which a decade or two before was considered too ethnic. Leslie Bannatyne writes that popular theme parties appeared in the early 1900s. Some of these themes included Cinderella parties that featured a game of picking up a burst bag of cornmeal, black cat parties that focused on a bad luck theme with open ladders and umbrellas as decor, and mother goose parties where guests would be expected to dress in nursery rhyme inspired costumes. One of the more imaginative and lasting ideas to come out of this time period was the Halloween haunted house. I am absolutely charmed by this description of an early haunted house in the October 1908 issue of the Ladies Home Journal. The cellar had been converted into a cavern. Running water was splashing over a cowbell tied under a faucet in the laundry, and it gave the sound of rushing water as the bell kept tolling dismally. Newspapers cut into strips and nailed to the crossbeams dangled about the heads of the victims and a hidden electric fan set the papers in motion, adding breezes of damp wind. As each hapless one descended into the cavern, a huge paper bag was burst over his head and a cold, wet hand was laid upon his brow. Yikes! Ooh, honestly, that is more disturbing than any haunt I've ever been to. So Victorians ruined and saved Halloween all within less than a century. Thank goodness for cold, wet hands and dogged pursuits of partying. There are so many more incredible Victorian party customs I didn't get to dive into today. Some I'm very happy to learn didn't last long, like melting lead into shapes that were supposed to correspond to your future husband's career. Uh, you're not going to get a future husband if you're melting lead. You're going to die within a year. So don't worry. There's always next week to get into all of that. Mm, unless I find a burr before then, and then I run away and get hitched. In the upcoming October episodes, we will be getting into haunted houses, costumes, trick-or-treat, candy, and all of the other Halloween customs that we love. If there's something specific you want to learn about Halloween, call into the All Hallows hotline at 802-532-DEAD or write me an eek mail at itsalwayshalloweenpodcast at gmail.com. And I finally caved and made a podcast-specific Instagram page. So please follow us there at It's Always Halloween Podcast for all the visuals that correspond with our episodes. Uh, you may be featured on one of our Small Fright episodes if you contribute something, and those come out every Friday. So look into that if you want to hear something a little looser and fly by the seat of your pants year. 
It's Always Halloween is researched, written, and performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner. The editing, theme music, and sound design is by Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at LTB Comedy and Pete at Mittenberries. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. Thanks so much for listening to It's Always Halloween. And come back next time, unless a cold, wet hand pulls you deep into a cavern.